Good evening, everybody, and you're all very welcome um, to our uh, European Green Leaf webinar today. We're delighted to have Dr. Kate McEnany, who's going to talk about Limerick's lesser horseshoe bats and lesser horseshoe bats in general. So it's a very exciting and a topic on a very intriguing species. So we're delighted to have Kate um, here with us from the Vincent Wildlife Trust. As you know, this is part of the European Green Leaf series. Um, and we will start now. There'll be questions and answers afterwards. So I'll hand over to you, Kate. Thanks very much, Sinead. And thanks to the organizers of uh, Limerick Green Leaf um, for inviting me to present this webinar, inviting the Vincent Wildlife Trust. I'm going to focus on the lesser horseshoe bat because of the important role that Limerick plays in the future of this species but also because there is information and great footage and audio calls of some of the other bat species found in the county that we created for the virtual bat walk for Limerick Green Leaf earlier in the summer. First of all, I'm going to describe the differences between the lesser horseshoe bat and our eight resident species. I'm going to say a few words about how I became fascinated by these small mammals and remain so. And then I'll go into more detail about the lesser horse bat in Ireland and in Limerick. Now, the lesser horseshoe bat in Ireland is the only member of what is known as the Rhinolophus family of bats, where rhine is the Latin word for horse and lophus the Greek word for crest. So they're known as horseshoe bats because part of the facial crest consists of a horseshoe shaped section of cartilage around their nostrils. In fact, the crest or nose leaf consists of three pieces of cartilage. Hopefully on the left hand side of this picture, you will see a horseshoe bat and two sections of the nose leaf. The upturned hatchet shaped lan uh, lancet and the uh, cella and the spear shaped lancet. Now all three pieces of the nose leaf are thought to prove the directionality of the echolocation calls which are emitted through the nostril. Okay, so we're looking at the uh, Horseshoe bat. I was describing the features on the the uh, the face of the vesper bat, of the lesser horseshoe bat. Um, so I was moving on to the other species, which is the vesper bats, and these are called vesper bats because the Latin word for evening is vesper. So the all the other bats in Ireland belong to the vespertilionid family, um, and they are recognised by their simple muzzle and by this additional feature in the ear called the tragus, and that's related to their echolocation. This hopefully will show you in, better, uh, in, in, in a better way, uh, the horseshoe shaped disc on the nostril, near the nostrils of the lesser horseshoe bat. And in this bat here, the brown long-eared bat, we can see it's a simple muzzle and there is a tragus. Now, just to point out at this stage that it is now best practice for us to always wear gloves when we're handling bats, and that's to prevent any risk of injury to either bat or human. Um, so these are old photographs that I'm showing you, but I think they're still worth showing. Another major difference between Leicester horseshoe bats and Vesper bats is that horseshoe bats have poor quadrupedal movement. That means that their pelvic girdle is poorly developed. So they're not able to land and crawl as other, our other bat species are. So they're not able to access small openings and they are definitely not found in bat boxes. Although, as you can see here, they are very happy to hang from a bat box if it so, if it so wishes. Compare that to the Vesper bats in the other photograph here. These are Leisler's bats and they are able to land and crawl and this uh, the door of this bat box has been removed so that we can see them inside so that's a major difference between the two groups now my interest in bats began one summer's evening um, when i was living my home at that time was on the other side of this lake which is rectory lake part of the valley bay wetlands center in the heart of county monaghan and a bat flew in through our kitchen window one evening, one summer, and it was my mother who lifted it down off the curtain when it eventually landed on the curtain 
and laid it, uh, placed it in my hand. And I can still remember how fast its heart was beating um, as it sat quietly looking up at me. So I decided then that that was when I wanted to learn more about these animals and in particular those in greatest need of conservation. So I approached Professor James Fairley, who was then in the zoology department of UCG, as it was then, now NUIG, and he agreed to supervise my research on the lesser horseshoe bat in County Clare. So I, we approached Paddy O'Sullivan, the gentleman in the corner of this photograph, who was with the National Parks and Wildlife Service at the time. He was based in County Clare, and he was the only person working on lesser horseshoes at the time. Now, Paddy was always in great form, but always very willing to encourage other people to go down into holes to look for lesser horseshoe bats. And he brought me to see uh, my first lesser horseshoe bat in April 1983. And this is me looking into one of the caves that Paddy, Paddy had grilled outside Ennis in order to prevent the bats from being disturbed. And as I said, I saw my first lesser horseshoe in one of these caves back in 1983. I, I have since swapped my casual wear for uh, proper caving equipment and I have got down and dirty in many occasions exploring holes for lesser horseshoe bats, um, both here, both here and abroad. Now, lesser horseshoe bats have a number of differences that set them apart from other bats and that makes it more challenging for them to be able to, to um, thrive and, and, and do well at the moment. Um, female bats, well all of lesser horseshoe bats, always hang free in a structure. Um, they always need to be able to fly into that structure and in summer they need old unoccupied buildings in which to rear their young. They generally move into these in April and they will give birth in June, beginning of, from beginning of June really through July. They give birth to one pup uh, or one baby bat, which is called a pup, and they suckle that for six weeks. But during that time, the females will um, obviously come out to feed themselves at night, to feed on insects, um, and they will make repeated flights over and back to the, uh, to her, to the pup in order to suckle it during the night. But sometimes, in the early days when the pup is still quite small, the uh, female will take the bat, the baby bat with her and hang it up nearby if there's somewhere that she can do so when it's safe. And this saves her a lot of energy because she then doesn't have to fly back from where she's feeding back into this maternity roost in order to suckle it a few times every night. Now, horseshoe bats always hang upside down and that could be a difficulty for a young pup, uh, but lesser horseshoe bats and all horseshoe bats have additional pelvic uh, nipples, we call them, in the pelvic, in the pectoral air, pelvic area, and that enables the pup to, to hang on. And this is um, quite a well-developed pup, you'll have to admit. Um, we know it's, it's the pup because of it's hanging from, from the female, but also because the fur in its body is gray, and it's only when it's a year old and undergoes its first molt that um, uh, it takes on the adult brown colour. Now we sit outside um, and, and, and count these bats as they're coming out in the summer and we do this to get an estimate of the adult numbers uh, emerging at dusk um, and we always believed that most of these bats were females but recent research by Dr, Dr. Andrew Harrington of Waterford Institute of Technology has um, informed us that in fact up to 50% of the bats that we count emerging can actually be males as well. So hopefully this works. <laughs> um, we count them in, uh, as I said, before the adults emerge and that, that gives us an estimate of, of, of the number of bats inside. Now, the sound that you hopefully heard there um, was the echolocation call of the lesser horseshoe bat. Now, normally we don't hear that because most of the sounds made by bats are ultrasonic. But by using a detector, a special piece of equipment called a bat detector, if we set that to between 108, 110 kilohertz, 
we are able to eavesdrop uh, on the sounds that the bats make. So the bat detector transforms the ultrasonic sound into an audible sound. And in the case of the lesser horseshoe, that's what I believe is a beautiful melodic warble. Uh, and for me, that is definitely, most definitely the sound of the summer. Now, hopefully in this photograph, you will see the beautiful broad wings of the lesser horseshoe bat. And along with its highly directional echolocation call and these uh, broad wings, it, it enables the bat, it's extremely manoeuvrable and it's able to fly within woodland, um, within uh, branches, um, and that's where it finds it, its insects. It can catch insects on the wing, but it also can hang from a branch, echolocating all the time, and if an insect is flying past, it will catch the insect. They eat a range of insects, um, small midges, crane flies, insects associated with, with, with dung, so um, dung flies. They um, also take moths as well. So they have quite a general, quite a general diet, thankfully. They catch these from, from, from dusk to dawn. They um, will, if they can, rest up out in the feeding area, their foraging areas, as I said, to, to save energy. Now they, they don't like to fly out in the open. So most of the photographs you will see of horseshoe bats are associated with, with, uh, with woodland, with a hedgerow, or even in the west of Ireland, uh, with stone walls, because that enables them to fly safely from, from place to place. Now, obviously, there are very few insects in the wintertime, and this is when our horseshoe bats hibernate. Now, all of our bats hibernate, but the lesser horseshoe bat is the only one about which we know, simply because we find it when we uh, go into underground structures to see them, underground sites in winter to see them. There could well be other bats, other Vesper bats tucked in, um, but we're not able to see them. But thankfully, the lesser horseshoe hangs free. Now, it's not always easy for us to get into these sites and often they're wet um, but once you do squeeze in and if there's a lesser horseshoe there you will see it hanging down. Um, they will hibernate from October to, to March and they choose sites that enable them to lower their body temperature and this saves energy and enables them to lower their metabolic rate. So for example in an underground site like this ideal Caves are ideal. The temperature could be about eight degrees centigrade, and the it's high in humidity, and there are perfect conditions for the bats to hibernate in. But they also use man-made structures if these also provide the same conditions. So we find them in mines and in cellars as well. Now, where do we find horseshoe bats throughout the world? Well, looking at this map here. Um, you will see that they are mainly a tropical and subtropical group of, of animals. There are 109 species of horseshoe and they are found, if we work our way from Eastern Australia, we work our way through um, Asia, into parts of Africa, on through Europe, and then finally we get to Ireland. And we have one species, we're very lucky to have one species in the horseshoe bat, lesser horseshoe bat here. And Ireland represents the most northerly distribution point for the species worldwide. And it's also the most westerly point in the European distribution for lesser horseshoes. Now for Ireland, we find them, they are restricted to the west of Ireland. And each of these yellow squares represents a 10K square where a lesser horseshoe has been recorded. Now the red areas indicate where there have been hundreds of records and then the lighter shades, the yellow, indicates where maybe there was only just a few records um, of, of horseshoe bats. Now they hug the west coast of Ireland. Now when they first arrived in Ireland thousands of years ago, they would have been distributed probably throughout the country. And we have evidence for this in fossils that were recovered from a cave in Waterford. But Thousands of years ago, Ireland was a well-wooded island. Um, and down through the millennia, as the woodland was cleared for agriculture or urbanization, generally human activity, um, the bats probably retreated because woodland is their preferred habitat. And so now they're found in parts of Mayo, 
Galway, Clare, Limerick, Cork and Kerry. Now there are two, two yellow dots outside that range um, and these are for Sligo and Roscommon and they are one-off records so they're not considered to make up part of their actual distribution range. We know quite a lot about the genetics, the DNA of horseshoe bats in Ireland, thankfully, from a number of studies. And Serena Dool conducted the first genetic research on lesser horseshoes when based in UCD. And she found by sampling, uh, taking small DNA samples from the bats, that there is a genetic differentiation happening within the species. And we've only got 13,000 of them in the, con in, in the west of Ireland. And she found this genetic differentiation between bats in the north of the range and bats in the south of the range. And what Serena has called the northern range and the southern range for them. So if you were to take a Mayo bat and look at its DNA without knowing it was from there and a Kerry lesser horseshoe bat, you would be able to see that there is a genetic difference, slight but still obvious. The second study was carried out by Andrew Harrington, and he was able to get more samples from a wider area of the, of the island. And he now believes that we're looking at three subpopulations of the lesser horseshoe. He believes, and there's evidence there, that the bats in North Mayo and Galway uh, are genetically different from those you find in the central area, and that's denoted by the bl blue line here. And that takes in South Galway and Clare and Limerick. And then we still have the Southern population. So there are three subpopulations in, in Ireland. Uh, bef before we look at some of the uh, challenges facing the lesser horseshoe bat, I think it's good to look back in time to when it was uh, discovered here. And this gentleman is Professor William King. And he was a professor of mineralogy, geology, and uh, natural history in Queen's College Galway, as it was then called, now NUIG. And he was in his home outside uh, Galway one summer's evening, a June evening in 1858, on preparing to go on a geology field trip when he discovered a bat flying around his dining room. And uh, eventually the bat was captured and he placed it, I think, in a glass jar and examined it and immediately recognised that there was a nose leaf and this was a new species for Ireland. But if you go through the literature, you'll find that the gentleman who is credited with discovering lesser horseshoes in Ireland for the first time is Mr. Frederick Foote, because in March 1859, he presented his discovery of lesser horseshoe bats in caves he was exploring for part of the Geological Survey of Ireland. Um, and so he is given the credit, rightly so, because he wrote up his report. Um, but I always felt a little bit sorry for Professor William King. Um, but in fact, he is an extremely well-known and famous scientist in his own right, because he was the first scientist to recognize a new uh, species of human, Neanderthal man, um, from fossil remains in Germany. So he has gone down in, in history. Um, um, the lesser horseshoe bat has, has, has been in, you know, in, in talked about and, and part of Ireland for, for a very, very long time. But it was really only in the 1980s that we began to do systematic surveying work. And that began with uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service um, with Paddy O'Sullivan, whom we met earlier, he began the first uh, national surveys really of bats um, traveling around the country. And um, at that time, he was checking out old buildings and he was finding lesser horseshoe bats in fine old buildings, castles and mansions. Um, and I think it was he who labeled them the bat of the aristocracy to begin with. Um, and today you will find throughout Europe the Lesser Horseshoe is in these tremendously beautiful old buildings, these castles. This is a photograph taken from a castle in southern Poland. But um, I'm afraid in Ireland it is sliding down the property ladder. 
and this is where you're more likely to find lesser horseshoes nowadays. Um, and that's simply because the roosts they would have occupied maybe 100 years ago or 50 years ago um, have uh, been, they've just become, fallen into, they're derelict, uh, they've been demolished, or possibly they have been uh, renovated. Now, lesser horseshoe bats are not found in modern buildings and they are generally not found in houses that are occupied, unless there's something like this here, where you can have the bats well away from human activity and they are confined to structures in the rural setting. So they are a bat of the rural landscape. Now this is a building, um, very typical of where you find horseshoe bats. This is the first building that Vincent Wildlife Trust purchased to protect the bats back in 1998. And when we took on the building, um, it was in this very sad, sorry, state of repair, an end wall had collapsed, but yet still 30 bats were using it. And that's simply because they had nowhere else to go. So we, over a couple of years, we painstakingly restored it. And we have since replaced the galvanize with natural slate. And this summer we had 150 lesser horseshoe bats emerging from it because they now have suitable roosting conditions. And this hopefully is um, an emergence image of the bats coming out and it's it's a small clip short clip and it's first played at normal speed and then it's slowed down and hopefully you'll be able to see a bat popping out and just at that moment a poor moth is flying past and it gets eaten by the bat This is another building that the Vincent Wildlife Trust has taken on. It's, uh, it was in Kerry. And again, you can see its condition, but still bats were using it. And this is how, um, on, on the other side, uh, this image here shows how it looks when it has been renovated. And we had um, between 250 and 300 lesser horseshoe bats use this each summer. At the moment, the Trust has 12 protected sites for the Lesser Horseshoe in Ireland. We have two in Mayo, one in Galway, one in Clare and eight in Kerry. And this summer we had approximately 4,000 bats using our reserves, uh, which is quite a sizable percentage of the population. But the first organisation to take a great leap and to purchase a building purely to protect the Lesser Horseshoes was in fact the Heritage Council and they purchased this building in Clare in 1998. Now the renovation of these buildings and the protection of these buildings is, is a very expensive exercise. Um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service have restored and have repaired many lesser horseshoe roosts. Um, I have also successfully created a number of artificial hibernation sites, which is a terrific achievement but this is a very major undertaking. Thankfully, there are smaller works, actions that we can take that will protect the species. And I'm gonna describe a number of those now. It's very important that we reduce the amount of, of heat uh, being lost from buildings. So we prevent drafts entering and we reduce the amount of light by fitting timber sheeting or baffles at the entrances used by the bats. So here we have timber sheeting, and this is the opening used by the bats. So it's surprising how much this will increase the temperature within the structure. Now, many of the outbuildings that the bats are using now are open to the roof. Many farm sheds are open to the roof. So we can, in, we can trap some hot air to make it more suitable for the bats by creating what we call a hot box. And this is by sheeting off a section of the roof, leaving a small opening for the bats to get in and out. The most important feature for lesser horseshoes at a building really initially is that they can get into it. Um, like swallows, they need to be able to fly directly into a structure. So these are the type of openings that we leave at uh, our sites. 
we recommend that you we leave at least 500 millimeters by 500 millimeter opening and we always protect these openings from predators by playing smooth metal sheeting so that a cat can't sit on the sill and catch the bats as they come out. We're also looking at putting up what we call night roosts on the landscape to assist the bats. I mentioned earlier that the females, when they're out foraging and they, they forage within just a few kilometers of the nursery site, if they have somewhere to hang up the pup or even to rest themselves, this will greatly aid their survival. So on the left here, this is a small temp and small timber structure that we have experimented with and we place these out in the landscape and the bats can rest up there during the summer. And over here, we can see volunteers of the Burn Bio Trust helping us to assemble and erect it. Now, the um, night roost is beside one of our reserves, the one in Galway, but in fact, it's on a neighboring farmer's land because that's where the bats forage. Now, as well as doing works at buildings, we have carried out research to find out more about how the bats are using the landscape because we also need to carry out measures in the landscape to assist them. And this often involves us um, setting up an outdoor lab. We catch the bats under special license away from the roosts so we don't disturb them at their roost. We fit the transmitter um, onto the, the back of the, the bat between the shoulder blades. And this will emit a signal that we can then follow at night. And if all goes well, if the transmitter stays on the bat, if our receivers and all our equipment works and the weather is good, we're able to find out where the animals feed and also any additional buildings that they may use. But we did this at one of our sites in Mayo. This is one of our maternity roosts. And we discovered that the bats were also using this fine ruin. This is Moor Hall in County Mayo and is owned by Mayo County Council. So we as humans need to cooperate and communicate so that we protect the colony when it's using both buildings. So rather than us thinking that we have bats in our building and we're going to protect it and do the right thing, we need to know where the other areas are that the bats are using and liaise and make sure that we're cooperating to protect the population and not just a single building. Through the research we've carried out here and elsewhere on where the bats go, we have a lot of information now on the types of habitats it needs. And with a grant from the Heritage Council, we were able to produce this leaflet, giving guidance to farmers on the practical steps that they could take to assist the bat. Many of the one measures that I've just described are at buildings, and it's available to download from our website. Um, and this brings us to our work with farmers in Limerick. And in 2017, our plan was to carry out um, over a five year period, work with farmers at 250 farms for the presence of lesser horseshoe bats and to carry out other measures. And we, we did this with Chagas, West Limerick Resources, Ballyhara Development and ICMSA. And it was one of the um, uh, projects developed under the Rural Development Programme funded by the Department of Agriculture. And uh, we, we all got together and we came up with a number of measures in our project that we were planning to carry out had we been successful to secure the funding. So we were planning to survey 250 farms with the presence of lesser horseshoe bats using passive detectors. And these are detectors that we leave out, the farmers would have left out on the land to detect the bats. And then had we been able to detect the bats, we would have set about improving conditions on the farms, creating roosts, putting up night roosts, maybe even creating hibernation sites. We were going to link farms with hedgerow, and obviously we were going to create a lot of other awareness and educational, uh, educational works as well. Um, now, unfortunately, we weren't successful in our proposal, but there was a lot of support from the farmers, and I do believe that there is interest there and we, ha we have the information to make, to make it happen for a well-targeted landscape agri-environmental scheme for horseshoes. 
Now, we concentrated in Limerick because we've known for a while that there are few lesser horseshoe roosts in the area, and this will become more important in a moment. The most important site in Limerick is without doubt Courage Chase. And this is uh, both a maternity and a hibernation site owned and thankfully it is owned and, and managed by, by Quilcha, but it is the only SAC in, in, in the county. And in fact, the lesser horseshoe bat is the only Irish bat species for which SACs have been designated. And that's because of its like, ecological needs, because it needs extra protection. We commissioned Neve Roach to do a study for us in uh, 1997, and she surveyed 185 properties in Limerick but found lesser horseshoes at only five additional ones. And one of the maternity roosts that she found held only 50 bats. So there's a small number of lesser horseshoes in Limerick. This is borne out, was borne out later when Bat Conservation Ireland carried out a study um, looking at the habitat availability to bats for all Irish bats. But this is the map that they produced for lesser horseshoes. And we can see that this corresponds very well to the map I showed earlier, Mayo, Galway, Clare, there's a gap here in Limerick and then down into Kerry and Cork. So that was the first evidence really that we had that there was few sites in, in Limerick. And we, we set about studying that. So we commissioned another study, this time with funding from the Irish Enver Environmental Network to look at why are there so few roosts there? And this study was carried out by Fanula Lyons first. And she found out that there are very few caves in Limerick because simply the geology doesn't support caves and we know that caves are important for hibernation. There are very few old estates, so very few old buildings that the bats could have used down through the generations um, that would have provided them with summer and possibly winter sites in cellars. There are a number of upland areas which the bat avoids, there's arable land which the bat avoids, and there's not a lot of deciduous woodland. So there are all reasons why they're not as common as they would be elsewhere. And in fact, Manula, if we found that really there's a 70 kilometer gap now between the roost up in Curra Chase, where we have a hundred or more lesser horseshoes in winter and summer, right down through uh, Limerick into Kerry, where we encounter the first other maternity roosts. That's quite a big gap for an animal that really only likes to stay within two to three kilometres of its, its nursery roost. We then looked to see, well, are there ways that the bat could move? And we commissioned, uh, we were very lucky really, uh, that we were able to um, have L Patrick Lenehan work as an intern with Kerry County Council, and he carried out modelling using landscape data of hedgerow and woodland. And he was able to uh, find that, again, this is Kerr Chase, and here we have our Kerry sites. And looking at the modelling, um, he used a, a pathway, a connectivity modelling tool um, to see how the bats could move. And he has proposed that there are, in fact, ways that the bat could follow, uh, avoiding the uplands. So we're wondering, well, why isn't the bat? Why aren't they using it? Or why aren't enough of them using it? Um, so this brings us right up to date this summer. Uh, we've had funding from National Parks and Wildlife Service, and uh, Dr. Donald Finch has been carrying out another modelling study, this time using circuitscape. And again, we're looking at potential ways that bats could move. And we're looking at ways or, or areas that are barriers to the bats. So this looks quite a pretty picture. It would probably look very well uh, framed on, on our wall. But in fact, it, it is a scientific method that highlights where the bats would avoid and possibly where they might um, be able to, to, to move through the area. So just to point out that the red areas are what we call areas of high functional connectivity. So these are possible pathways that bats could use to get from one place to another. And the blue areas are areas the bat will avoid. So they're no-go areas. And they usually um, uh, relate to towns where you've got a lot of 
artificial light coming out uh, offland areas or other unsuitable areas. So to look in more detail at um, the, the Limerick and, and Kerry area, this may look like a, a child's map of Ireland, but in fact it is a diagrammatic representation of um, the, 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 the southern area. The green circles represent roosts up in Ennis. So you can see South Galway and Clare, we've got lots of roosts. Down here, we get into Kerry, West Cork, plenty more roosts. And then we've got this gap here coming down from Limerick, a few roosts uh, down into Newcastle West, Abbeyfield. Um, but there are red lines there. Uh, so there are ways that the bats could use. So what we now have to do is, well, find out why aren't they using them and what can we put in place to encourage more of them to use them? Um, should the funding ever become available for that? And this brings me to my, my last, but second but last slide, where we're looking at the 20 most charismatic species. And this was a study carried out and the authors wanted to find out just what, what animals feature highly for people. Um, and people are, are, are attracted to um, charismatic animals and, and when they are, um, they will make funding available uh, to fund conservation for them. Um, and these 20 animals represent the most charismatic animals from this study. And by charismatic, they meant that they were beautiful, they were impressive, they were rare, or they were, they were endangered. Um, and most of them are large terrestrial um, mammals. Now you will spot there are a few uh, non-mammals in, in there, um, but most of them are. Uh, and how we perceive animals at risk um, controls or relates to money that is available to NGOs uh, in order to carry out conservation work. And it, it also influences the, the decisions made by policymakers as to what species might be in, in the news and, and what is grabbing the uh, people's attention. So I know it's going to be a long time before a bat makes it into the top 20 because most people don't consider them to be beautiful and impressive, but they are endangered. Um, there are over a couple, several hundred species of bat that are, are actually endangered. Um, but I do hold out hope that um, we will be able to uh, have funding to protect the lesser horseshoe bat before it would ever uh, become so much at risk. So thank you for your attention and I'm very sorry for the hiccups at the beginning and I hope that you still enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, and just before we throw it open to, to questions, to uh, questions and answers, um, and with yourself obviously um, uh, answering. Um, I'd just like to, the Vincent Wildlife Trust, it's been in Ireland since the 80s? Um, well, it first became involved in Ireland in the 1980s, and that was when um, the Trust funded the first otter service. Uh, the Trust was responsible for conducting the first national otter survey. Um, but I've been working for the trust uh, with the trust from 1991, um, and uh, there are two of us now working full time here: my colleague Ruth, Annafee, and myself. Yeah, um, and it's based in the UK as well. Yes, yes. The, the head office is in the UK. It is actually a UK wildlife charity, but we have uh, obviously a, a long term permanent base here in Ireland but we're also working on supporting conservation projects in Europe as well. So it's, it's really wherever mammals are at, at, at risk and where work needs to be done. Okay. Um, there's some lovely comments in. Great talk. Thanks for all the great information from Francis and very informative. Thank you from Aina Gallagher and from Ken Crowley. Thanks very much. Really interesting presentation. And what we don't have is lots of questions, Kate. <laughs> So well, one thing <laughs> that maybe... it brilliantly. <laughs> um, there is a gap there in Limerick. Um, how do you think between landowners, local authorities, farmers, um, and all the rest of it, how do you think that we might um, help 
I suppose, that connectivity that you spoke about? Yeah, um, it's it's a case, I think, of us. Um, it would be really lovely to have an action plan to, 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 to get the funding to put an action plan together. And then we'd be able to exactly pinpoint what people can do and where they can do it. But basically, we need to uh, provide more roosting sites um, in the counties where it occurs. So we don't need these large buildings anymore. We need, we need lots of small buildings dotted around the landscape. Um, we could do with creating a few artificial hibernation sites, definitely, um, in, the, in the Limerick area, because that is, is, I'd say, a major limiting factor. And we need to link up farms as well. And I know from, from the work we did with the farmers in Limerick, they were really interested in this project because it's such an easy bath to care for. Uh, an old building is, is not of great value to anyone else, but it's of real importance to the, to the bat. And linking up maybe one little bit of woodland by putting up an, a night roost, it just might be a, a stepping stone for the species. Yeah. So um, we know what to do, we know how to do it. We're getting better at knowing where to do it. It's getting our hands on the money to do it. Yeah. So it's kind of small, small, simple actions, if you like. We have exactly, yeah. exactly. A, lot, a lot of small actions on a wide scale. Very good. Okay. Um, we have a question in from Hillary, and Hillary is saying, how might climate change affect the Irish lesser horseshoe population? Um, depending on what model you look at, um, some believe that it will be able to move out into other areas um, if the temperature improves, um, because it is, it, it's hugging the West Coast now, probably because of, of the milder winters. Um, but it, it, it's affecting it in that we can get very, very hot summers. And that could mean that some of the roosts are too hot for it. Okay. Or we can get very, very cold winters and some of the hibernation sites that it uses, if, it's, if they're not natural caves, um, can mean that they can actually suffer in winter. So it's, it's like a lot of other wildlife, it's extremes. Um, so we need to be building some resilience into the work we're doing. So providing them with a variety of sites so that if it is a very cold spring, if some are warm to go, if it's very hot, if some are cooler to go in the summer. So we are aware of that. OK, OK. Um, we have one in from Francis. We have bats that visit our house in North Clare every evening during the summer. Could it be a lesser horseshoe? And how could I find out? Um, it could be because of, of it being County Clare, but um, lesser horseshoes tend to avoid humans and the activities of humans and that includes uh, obviously artificial lighting so um, it, it could be if they're in a very rural setting and if there's an area that's not brightly lit um, it could be but it's if they're seeing bats flying out in the open it's more likely to be pipistrelles because okay. lesser horseshoes okay. hug the landscape they, they don't like they're not able to fly out in the open so it's you really have to be on top of the lesser horseshoe with the bat detector to hear it. It'll be hugging the hedgerows. Um, so if you're seeing a bat flying out in the open, it's unlikely to be a lesser horseshoe. Okay. Uh, we have an interesting one from Joe now as well, and it's based on DNA difference. Do we have an idea of how many years since the different population groups in Ireland have separated? We don't. No, no. Maybe in time when uh, when that 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 the technology, you know, the, the, the DNA testing is there, um, we we don't. Um, but I suppose looking back in, at, at social history and the development of the, of your changes in the landscape over time, that's well documented. So um, it's probably a couple of hundred years uh, because of of the changes that we've made, or maybe the last one or two thousand years uh, with. It's, probably from the 16th, 17th century onwards, when there was the vast clearances of woodland, because the lesser horseshoe was a woodland bat. Um, so although we think we may have uh, quite a few now of 13,000, we may have had 300,000 back, you know, 7,000 years ago, who knows? So um, it's it, it's difficult to know, but it's look at the wildlife. It's, it's probably accelerated in the last hundred, couple of hundred years. Yeah from Georgina, would the bats choose a cave or other roost over a building if both were available? They will choose the underground site in winter because that's when they'll be hibernating and they need to lower their body temp and save energy. They will use buildings during the summer because that's when they need to be active 
and that's when the females need to be warm and they cluster together in order to, to rear their young. Um, but having said that, uh, at some of our sites in Kerry, where you have mild winters, um, the bats are very bold. They roost in the attic space during the summer and then they simply fly down to the ground floor and they hibernate there in the winter because the conditions are mild enough. Another the reason I say that's bold is because it means that we we haven't an opportunity sometimes to do repair work on it because they're always there. But generally they do separate out where they roost winter and summer. Okay. Um, another one from Georgina. Do you know if other bat species avoid the same areas that the lesser horseshoes use? No, um, we often find them sharing roosts with species. At some of our reserves, we know that there are brown long eards using them. Um, it's not that there would be active competition between them. We have we have so few species, and um, there is still plenty of food around. And lesser horseshoe comes out relatively late in the evening. It's not competing with the pipistrels for all the swarms of midges. It feeds throughout the night. So um, some of our, our other bats would be more active at dusk and again at dawn when you have these swarms of insects. So Benton's bats feed over water. You won't find lesser horseshoes feeding over water. Lighter's bats feed much higher. So there is a resource partitioning between the bats. Yeah. So don't believe that there is any, um, not in this country, is there any direct competition between the species. Okay. Um... Would TYs in schools be a way, any way of raising awareness or creating projects around lesser horseshoes? And have you considered that? Um, or if I, no, we, we haven't, but there is tremendous scope there. Um, and I know when, you know when we are able to occasionally go into schools or provide educational information for, to schools, um, uh, young people are terrific. Uh, and they're, they're, you know, they, they are very, very interested. So. Yes, we, we do need to have information from, you know, very, you know, at, relevant to, to the various age groups all, all, all the way up. Yeah. Um, from um, somebody is just querying about the, the grounds of Moor Hall, as there's a lot of work going on there at the moment. And would you think that could potentially affect, affect the bats in the area? Yeah, there, there is a lot of work because um, it's it was um, uh, acquired by Mayo County Council, but they are very aware of the bats there and they value them highly. So it isn't it isn't necessarily the case that you can if you have bats, you can do nothing. Um, there's been a lot of uh, survey work done and there's a lot of information available there now. So I'm quite sure that whatever has been done is being done in a way that's not going to uh, adversely affect the bats and in fact could actually enhance bats okay. because they, they are a tremendous tourist attraction. Uh, they are, you know, you can develop a lot of ecotourism around the bats and Moor Hall would be an ideal place for that. So no, you can with, with carefully and the same when you're when you're doing any kind of construction work um, providing you survey beforehand well in advance and you know where to put the particular structures that you need to to cater for the bats, you can do both. You can do both. That's very good mm -hmm. to hear. Um, from Joe, when you establish a new night roost or buildings for bats, how do the lesser horseshoe bats find these? Well, what we do is we, um, we, in the case of the one that we have at one of our reserves, we had or we had placed out passive detectors beforehand. And in fact, my, my colleague Ruth is doing a very extensive study using passenger detectors around within a three kilometer radius of our reserve. And so we had a very good idea already of where the bats were active. And we positioned it at a spot where we knew that they were flying along. Perfect. So it, again, it's, it's location, location, location. Um, if you, you do your, your survey work beforehand and then you position the structure that they need in the right place. Um, and that, that, that's actually really important because sometimes there are mitigation works done and they don't work. And it's because they were in the wrong place or they weren't put in place in plenty of time for the bats to find them before their original route was disrupted. Very good. Um, we have another one in asking the same question about Moor Hall from Mary, but you've answered that beautifully already. Yeah. Um, from NASA, 
She was surprised to see that bat roosts in the photographs had corrugated roofs and yeah. she thought bats weren't so keen to roost with that material. Is just is it just the lesser horseshoe that doesn't mind? Oh, it does mind. Um, it's not happy under those galvanized roofs. That's why when the money is available, when we had that access to funding, we replaced all of all of those roofs with natural slate. Natural slate is the is the ideal roofing material for horseshoe bats because the slate heats up slowly during the day and then it releases the heat slowly at night. And that's perfect for the young bats because before they're the full covering of hair, they're not able to thermoregulate. So it's really important that there is a heat source and a constant, maybe slow release heat source over the over the 24 hours. Okay. The reason they're under the galvanized roofs is because there's nowhere else to go. Um, now we can, we, we can put in um, hot boxes, but you generally add in additional timbers for them to hang from. They're not ideal, um, but in the absence of funding to do anything better, um, they're better than nothing. Very good. Um, and then this one from Justin, our final question of the evening. We've kept you quite a while, Kate. Is it better to investigate old buildings on the farm and then ca contact somewhere like the Vincent Wildlife Trust to let, let you know that the bats are there or how to go about it? Um, yeah, it, it, with, with lesser horseshoes, that's the beauty of the species, um, is that if they are using a structure, you will see them. Um, now, they may not always be using it, you know, throughout, throughout the whole year, um, but their droppings are actually quite easy to recognise as well. Um, and uh, it, if, if you do find something that looks like a mouse dropping, but that there's a few little insect wings scattered amongst the, the droppings, um, they, 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 those droppings could be from bats. So um, generally, we advise people to contact their conservation ranger because there would be a conservation ranger in their area, hopefully and uh, notify them first and they're all well experienced in in lesser horseshoes and we'll be able to have a look and see and then we would be able to advise if we could on any measures that the person was willing to willing to do willing to take and i should have mentioned that that there are some individuals that have actually modified buildings for the lesser horseshoes as well um not that many but some of them have done it and the other thing I should have mentioned as well, without my notes, was that we were able to, we were very grateful with Donal's study using Circuscape, those fabulous maps with the red and the blue, um, the local, all the local authorities, the six local authorities, um, provided us with information on all of the artificial lights that are around in all six authorities, all local authorities. And we're very, very grateful to them for doing that for the purpose of the study, because that has showing up shown certain areas where um, the bats are definitely going to avoid because artificial light is obviously um, a, a problem for a lot of biodiversity, particularly nocturnal animals like lesser horseshoe bats. So um, that's giving us an insight as well into where to avoid and where we might put conservation actions in the future. Very good. Um, actually, Kate, we have a, one final question in from David. Um, Typically, how far will a bat travel from a roost to feed? The lesser horseshoe, um, generally two to three kilometers. That's all. If you know, they will they will stay local. And I think we can relate to how small an area that is, seeing as we were confined to two kilometers earlier this summer because of COVID nineteen. So it really is. They don't like to undertake long long distance flights, not on a regular basis, and not when they're hunting at night because. The, the way they fly is, is is a high cost to them. It takes up a lot of energy. So they try and reduce the amount of energy that they expend by staying local. Okay. Kate, thank you so much for what was a lovely presentation, delightful insight into the world of the lesser horseshoe bat. Um, we're delighted you were able to participate in the webinar. And thanks as well. We might add that yourself and Ruth um, did the the virtual bat walk in Curra Chase. And for anybody who's learning about bats and learning how to use bat detectors, that's up on the um, European Greenleaf Europe, uh, YouTube channel and well worth uh, a look. Um, it would help you with that. Um, on that note, we're going to say sorry. It's also yeah, there's also the Limerick Bat Group for people in Limerick, Absolutely. Limerick uh, Bat Group's Facebook page. 
Great. Yeah. The, a great. Thank you so much. I'm so <laughs> terrible for me from Limerick to forget that. Thank <laughs> you so much. Um, no, that's great. And thank you so much for, for a wonderful talk this evening. Good night, everybody. Our next um, webinar in this is actually on tree diseases and it's coming up quite quickly on um, the 1st of October. So you expect an email about that for, for everybody who participated tonight. Okay, thank you. Good night now. Thank you.